Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our June public lecture featuring Dr. Aaron D'Souza and Dr. Amber Hood discussing Egyptology's interdisciplinary future. And I'm Lisa Radici, RC's U.S. Director, and I'm really pleased to have each of you with us today. So before we get started, a few reminders that the large scale lectures like this one produced by the RCUS office will be pausing for the summer and resuming in the fall, but please stay tuned to the calendar at, uh, that's posted on rc.org as there are many virtual chapter lectures taking place throughout the summer. And while many of the chapter lectures are open to non-chapter members, I do encourage you to affiliate with a chapter if you have not done so. So even if there's not a chapter near you locally, you're welcome to affiliate with one nearby or one that you uh, feel a kinship with. So, of course, I want to give a special welcome to all of our RC members. And RC members, of course, are the lifeblood of our organization, and we could not undertake our work without your support. But if you are joining us today and are not yet an RC member, we'd absolutely love to have you join us. And I encourage you to do so. And for a limited time, we're actually running a promotion, um, a 10% discount on a regular one level, uh, one year level membership. Um, and I'll put that in the chat. Um, and this is open to new members only, but we hope that you'll uh, use this as an opportunity to join us um, and then be able to take advantage of our member only lectures that will begin again in the fall. So today I'm honored to introduce to you our lovely speakers, Dr. Aaron D'Souza of the Austrian Archaeological Institute and Dr. Amber G.E. Hood of Lund University. Dr. Hood is a researcher based at the Department of Geology at Lund University with a background in both Egyptology and archaeological science. She is particularly interested in research that takes a multi and interdisciplinary approach to the study of ancient Egypt and its neighbors. Her main research focus is optically stimulated luminescence, OSL, dating of ceramics housed in museum collections and portable in situ OSL analysis. She is currently the scientific coordinator for the DAI University of Vienna's Marinith project at Abydos and founding editor of the new journal, Interdisciplinary Egyptology. And Erin D'Souza is an archaeologist specializing in Nubian material culture. His research takes an object-based approach to the complex inter- and intra-cultural connections that took place across the Greater Nile Valley region during the second millennium BCE. Dr. D'Souza is the Nubian ceramic specialist within the Tel Edfu project and has previously worked on excavation projects at Heraclopolis, Elephantine, Aswan, Dandara, Halwan, in addition to great fund, excuse me, grant funded museum based research projects in Sweden, the UK, the US and Italy. Dr. D'Souza is also a founding editor of the new journal Interdisciplinary Egyptology. So today our speakers are here to explore what does it actually mean to be interdisciplinary and why is that necessary for the survival of Egyptology as an academic discipline. Please welcome our esteemed speakers, Dr. Amber Hood and Dr. Aaron D'Souza. Great, thanks, thanks so much, Lisa, for that, that really generous introduction. And, um, and to Arcee for inviting us to speak to you all today, um, and especially to Jody Deutsch and to Yasmin el Shazli for, for the initial invitation for inviting us to come and give this paper to you today, or tonight, where Amber and I are actually. Um, but, um, and also thank you to everyone for attending on a Saturday. This is really great that, that we're able to share this news with you because we're really excited to introduce this new initiative that Amber and I, together with Professor Christiana Curley here in Vienna, have started that we hope will encourage some tangible change and progress in Egyptology as a scientific discipline. And that initiative is called Interdisciplinary Egyptology, or we call it INTEG for short. Um, and INTEG is a new and fresh approach to Egyptological publication. It is hosted by the University of Vienna and the Austrian Institute for Egyptology. It is fully online. It is double blind, double blind peer reviewed. It has an editorial team of internationally recognized scholars who we'll be introducing later on. And probably the best of all is that it is completely free and immediate open access publication at no cost to the author. 
Um, publication is also going to be on a rolling basis, which means that we'll have fast turnaround times. We're aiming for about 12 weeks from submission to publication. And it is ultimately, it is a journal published by Egyptologists of all kinds, for Egyptologists of all kinds, and anyone inter and any interested readers or anyone who is interested in the topic of Egyptology in its broadest sense. So again, thank you very much for welcoming us here today and for giving us up your, uh, giving us the opportunity to discuss something that means so much to both uh, to all of us at Integ. So one thing we really wanted to communicate today is what we mean by interdisciplinary, because really, as we will see, it's not altogether that straightforward and exact definitions can actually change discipline by discipline. So in naming our journal Interdisciplinary Egyptology, it was very important for us to set out what this meant in practical terms um, and for us as editors. Um, and this topic will also be addressed in an article in our first uh, special edition, which will showcase the summaries of the panel discussions that we hosted for the journal's launch back in February and March. So both an archaeological scientist and an Egyptologist, my own research has always been heavily influenced by collaboration with others. And together we make up a research community. And this I think is easiest to visualize as a street or a cul-de-sac. So at the top of the street, we have the biggest house. And I'm gonna call this house, the house of Egyptology. Now, of course the house of Egyptology has um, a big tree in front of its garden. And that tree represents ancient Egypt. Now the house is one with a lot of windows and in different Egyptologists um, were standing at every window of the house looking out, each would see the tree from a slightly different angle and in a different way. Uh, their different perspectives are subdisciplines of Egyptology. And I think it's possible to identify five subdisciplines uh, within Egyptology, of course, archeology, span philology, art history, culture and society and history. Although of course you could argue that um, culture and society and history permeate the other three to the extent that they can't easily be separated. But the House of Egyptology and the Tree of Ancient Egypt, they're not alone in the cul-de-sac. They're part of a bigger community, um, a, a neighborhood. Surrounding them are houses which, are each represent, uh, which each represent another discipline. Through the eyes of the occupants of these houses looking out of their windows, when they look at the Tree of Ancient Egypt, they see things from a different perspective to those exclusively hanging out in the House of Egyptology. Now, of course, I've adapted the name the House of Egyptology from the House of Science, which was first discussed by the uh, physicist uh, Robert Oppenheimer in 1953, who said that this house uh, is an open house, open to all comers. In 1972, cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead took the idea a necessary step further to introduce a room of interdisciplinarity into the House of Silent, uh, Science. This room would be one in which explorers or researchers would bring back their discoveries from other rooms to share with the interdisciplinary rooms occupants. So in our cul-de-sac, the interdisciplinary Egyptologists are the one that, ones that leave the house, go and talk to their neighbours. They wander about the street, learning more about the tree by looking at it and learning about it from other viewpoints from the different houses. And many Egyptologists, of course, already do this. So the take home is that communication and interaction, discussion and active dialogue is central to interdisciplinary research and in our opinion to Egyptology's interdisciplinary future. It's hard to be interdisciplinary on your own and in fact to do it well I would actually argue that it's impossible. Um, but it's not difficult to embrace interdisciplinary research. Um, communication and collaboration is key and sometimes we're interdisciplinary without even realizing it. And I'd like to very heavily stress at this point that no one in any of the houses is any better than anyone else, they're just different. The point is, is that each house is equal and it's fundamental to furthering the study of ancient Egypt, um, to seeing all angles and views of, of our tree of ancient Egypt just in slightly different ways. So to delve a bit deeper into what interdisciplinary means, um, it's really actually necessary to understand the terms surrounding it too. Um, many of these are relatively new terms and their meanings are often governed on a subject specific basis rather than by a detailed dictionary based definition. And I would really like to emphasize here that my thoughts on this are still being formed and that what I'm about to discuss may not necessarily reflect the views um, thoughts of the whole intake team either. 
but I feel that in naming a journal interdisciplinary Egyptology, we certainly have to start having this discussion. So the best summary I have yet to see on uh, what interdisciplinary really means is by Marilyn Stemba. And I highly recommend uh, to you that you read this really clear, concise and excellent article. Um, in it, Stemba lays out the intellectual, practical and pedagogical arguments for interdisciplinary research and offers a clear definition of it. And to achieve this definition, Stemba makes reference to the bedfellows of interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinarity. She defines interdisciplinary within um, what she calls a typology that also includes intradisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. And um, on the slide here, you can see those in, a, in an ascending broadness of scope from the bottom left to the top right. Uh, Jensenius uh, added to Stemper's discussions further by conceptualizing these five terms into the circle patterns that you see here on the screen one of which uh, we've modified um, in the visualization, which is cross-disciplinary. Intradisciplinary is of course pertaining to research that works within a single discipline. Uh, as I said a moment ago, within Egyptology, I consider this to mean the classical Egyptological five-pronged approach um, and pursuit of art history, archeology, span philology, um, culture and society and history or Egyptology subdisciplines. So one could, of course, argue that these topics are diverse enough in themselves to be considered interdisciplinary. But I actually think that um, this view is too Egyptology focused. And my counter argument would be that these five are the very cornerstones of the modern Egyptological discipline. And all are usually interwoven within first stage Egyptological training. And I think that we can start to think of Egyptology as something more than just the big five. I think that to be truly interdisciplinary, we really have to start reaching beyond this. So next we have, and of course, many people already do, and that's fantastic. So next up, we have uh, cross-disciplinary, where a discipline is viewed from the uh, perspective of others. So our light blue circle of Egyptology is being looked at by someone in another discipline uh, illustrated in dark blue. So for example, um, an, an example of cross-disciplinary research would be a, mod a modern medical doctor analyzing an ancient Egyptian medical text. Multidisciplinary comes next. And it's of course this term that is most often conflated with interdisciplinary. And many people use them interchangeably and that's something I have certainly done in the past myself multiple times and of course colloquially they can of course still be used interchangeably but in its true sense multidisciplinary means the collaboration of researchers from multiple and distinct disciplines who each bring something unique to the table uh, in Egyptology some digs are of course multidisciplinary you have bioarchaeologists and physical anthropologists working alongside archaeobotanists working alongside traditional field archaeologists working alongside geoarchaeologists um, on the slide we see the darker blue dot of the other disciplines surrounding um, uh, other uh, the lighter blue dot of Egyptology now, interdisciplinary goes one step further. It pertains to the integration of a multidisciplinary approach into a single form. In our DIG analogy, it might be that a DIG director brings all the multidisciplinary research together into a coherent whole. Um, they weave all the information together to create a more complex, detailed and nuanced understanding of their subject by collaborating with others to help them achieve this cohesion. We can still see the light blue dot of Egyptology at the center, but there are many overlapping and intertwining once dark blue dots that make up an interdisciplinary approach. Transdisciplinary is the last, and in my opinion, the most complex. Um, this is when we transcend and go beyond known disciplinary frameworks to the point that in some more extreme cases, a whole new discipline is formed. Uh, for a non-Egyptological explanation of transdisciplinary, we can look to an example in the sciences. So biochemistry uh, is at its most basic, a merger of biology and chemistry to the extent that they have formed a new discipline. I also think in the past within archeology span as a whole, some of the archeological applications um, to of physical phenomena, for example, um, radiocarbon dating, uh, have resulted in um, transdisciplinary methods in Egyptology. 
So transdisciplinary is a tricky one, and I certainly welcome anyone's thoughts on um, how we could better define it for Egyptology. So for my part, I think that at the very beginning, Egyptology was in fact transdisciplinary, and Aaron will go into this um, in more detail shortly. Egypt took, um, Egyptology took archaeology, art history, philology, and made it into its own, applying them to ancient Egypt to form Egyptology. Uh, in this respect, once we hit transdisciplinarity, perhaps we go back to the start again and once more become intradisciplinary. In this case, perhaps we're best to not think about disciplinarity as linear, but rather as a non-linear spiral, cyclical to some extent, but ever building upon its foundations. And I think visualizing disciplinarity this way better reflects the equality, relevance of all and importance of all research within Egyptology. But let's reverse from theory and into the practicalities. Where does all this leave us for INTEG? What does the journal name Interdisciplinary Egyptology really mean to us as editors and for you as authors? Um, well, and our community. I would say that our primary aim is that we want to encourage new dialogue and to help researchers spark new ideas. We also don't want to scare off and anyone and make people think that their research doesn't quite fit. Um, like all things that we try to neatly fit into predefined boxes, this rarely works. And um, in practice, and therefore, we're really willing to acknowledge that flexibility will have to be called for in, um, in our work at INTEG. We're also willing to listen if you think that we've got this wrong. If you think that your research is something of interest to INTEG's audience, but doesn't quite fit easily into the categories that we've spoken of here, reach out and we're happy to change our minds. Again, dialogue is always key. So in the broader sense, when it comes to publication, we'll focus on multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, and where possible, transdisciplinary research. And I think the sections that we have in INTEG, which again, Aaron will discuss shortly, clearly illustrate this. Um, intradisciplinary research is of course the very foundation of Egyptology, but it's not our focus at INTEG. We want to be a home for those publications where more traditional Egyptological journals have said, no, that's not within our scope. Um, at INTEG, we pride ourselves on our broad scope where what binds us most strongly is a dedication to bringing interdisciplinary research to Egyptology while upholding the most rigorous academic and scientific standards. So at its heart, INTEG's goal is to publish research that meaningfully incorporates two or more disciplines. And we certainly want to avoid what STEMBA identifies as a problem with the now often bandied about term interdisciplinary. Uh, it's about avoiding a situation where colleagues from different disciplines talk about each other, not with each other. We don't want to just be a journal that publishes non-integrative research um, from many different disciplines or even interwoven sub-disciplines of Egyptology. We want the research that we publish to be integrative and to go beyond the traditional borders of Egyptology as a discipline. We want to champion new connections and collaborations. And so anyone who attended any of our um, recent panel discussions that Amber mentioned earlier in uh, March and April this year, um, would be familiar with this quote that was coined by our editor-in-chief, Christiana Kohler, and which we then used to introduce every one of our events. And it's become something of a motto for the journal. And that quote is that Egyptology is interdisciplinary or it is nothing. And that quote made us realize in the planning stages for the journal that Egyptology actually did begin as an interdisciplinary pursuit, as Amber mentioned earlier. Because if we think about the early, expedition, sorry, the early expeditions led by the French and the Prussians, um, while being fully aware and cognizant of all of the colonialist, colonialist motivations behind those expeditions, um, they were at their heart interdisciplinary expeditions because the people documenting those monuments and the art, um, they also included with them artists, architects, botanists, geolo geologists, zoologists, anthropologists, and so on. And that interdisciplinarity is captured really beautifully and clearly in the plates of, the, of documents like the Description de l'Egypte. Um, because all of these people were working together to document Egypt and Nubia. Um, and Egyptology somehow over the course of the, the coming decades and century, um, the focus started to narrow somewhat. And it's possibly, or quite likely because Egypt became to be seen as one of the classic subjects. And so therefore the written historical and art artistic records took precedence over material culture and objects and zoology and, and plans and things. 
So other disciplines like the technical study of architecture, so going beyond just what the architecture looks like, but, but understanding how buildings were made or scientific approaches to botany and faunal remains that we might find in Egypt, we're now sort of becoming satellite fields that orbit around the historical core of what Egyptology became. But we also noticed that there was a growing sense of dissatisfaction within, amongst a lot of people with how inward looking Egyptology had become as an academic discipline. And we'd heard numerous stories from many colleagues and had ourselves experienced some frustration that research that didn't explicitly focus on things like written historical records or artistic records was considered by some people, not all people, important to say not all people, but just some people, um, to be not real Egyptology. And the frustration came because we were all, we were all trying to tell the same story, just we're trying to tell different parts of that same story, just like the, the houses looking at the same tree that Amber talked about in her introduction. Um, and there's also this sense of Egyptological exceptionalism, that Egyptology was somehow different or special and partly or largely because of its, the richness and the sheer volume of the historical data that we have available to us, as well as the exceptional preservation of the archaeological remains. But rather than, being, rather than that being a reason to be exclusive, we at INTEG think that this wealth of data is Egyptology's biggest asset. And in our opinion, it should be a reason to open up to different perspectives and to be more inclusive and more, integra and more integrative and diverse in our scientific approaches. Because we can't fully understand that wealth of data from just a traditional Egyptological perspective alone. So by making these new connections that look beyond the traditional boundaries of Egyptology, we can generate completely new perspectives and rethink what we thought we knew for the last 100 or 200 years. We can also ensure that Egyptology keeps pace with other academic disciplines. We can maintain scientific relevance by connecting with cutting edge research in other fields. And this is especially important now when funding to humanities subjects is being cut dramatically around the world, when archeology span departments are being shut down or completely or restructured. And we can also encourage new voices and welcome input from people or communities that might otherwise have been excluded from the conversation in the past. But ultimately we, what, we, what we want to do is to broaden the scope of what Egyptology is as a modern scientific discipline. So we've spoken a lot so far about the theoretical and conceptual framework behind INTEG. Um, and now we're going to focus a little bit more on the practical. So I mentioned a short while ago that we want INTEG to be a platform to promote meaningful collaboration and dialogue within Egyptology. And that will focus primarily on publishing into multi trans and cross disciplinary research. Um, but we want INTEG to be inclusive and diverse and we want the community that we um, or build together to reflect that. Integ is not a gatekeeper um, to interdisciplinary research, but rather an usher. And interdisciplinary research is available, accessible and achievable by all. And I think much of this is best summed up in this image um, of the two hieroglyph based figures reaching out to one another and taking each other's hands that Ken Griffin used to illustrate the collaboration between Integ and the Egypt Centre in Swansea during our panel discussions. Uh, which the Egypt Centre kindly hosted on their Zoom platform. So the idea is we reach out to one another and work together. And we also want to take this opportunity to let you know that we are dedicated to being the first Egyptological journal that has an impact factor. Um, in order to do this, uh, we need everyone to pitch in and to help out. Um, attaining an impact factor will be dependent on the quality of research that is submitted and our ability to show that INTEG is relevant to, is relevant to Egyptology. And another level of communicating that idea of inclusivity and diversity is our logo, which we love. So we just want to spend a bit of time talking about it. Um, it was designed by a, a very special person to me, my, my partner of many years, um, Adam Grubner, who designed and created the logo for the journal. And even though it looks fairly simple, um, it's actually got a, a number of levels of, of hidden references and meanings that relate to the journal's goals and also to the three of us as its founders. Um, so if we look at the shape of the, the logo, starting with just the basic semicircle shape is inspired by the hieroglyph Neb, um, which we most of us would know means all or every because we are encouraging all encompassing, all inclusive research. And the Neb shape is also a nod to philology because we, we will we still want to have philology as part of our research that we publish. The I, which you can see on the side of the logo, stands for interdisciplinary, but it also stands for things like information, but it's also a nod to science and technology. So we know things like the iPhone or the internet and things like that. 
Um, the E is cleverly disguised in the outline of the MEB. The E obviously stands for Egyptology in the title of the journal, um, but it also looks like a pottery illustration and it's a nod to material culture. And the lines, the horizontal lines that make the E are also like the gradation marks you might see on a test tube or a beaker. So it's again, referencing science. Um, but the, it's also a hidden reference to the fact that the three founders of the journal, Christiana Kerler, myself and Amber, all have, a, we, we love pottery. We're, we're all ceramic people at heart, um, even though our research looked at ceramics in a very interdisciplinary way. Um, and the shape of the logo um, incorporates these I and, I and E, and as I said, it's, it's a pottery drawing. So it looks like something that we are all very familiar with. The colors also refer, reference Egypt. Um, the blue represents the Nile. Um, it was also inspired by the color Eau de Nile, which was from the you know, Egypt Domania period, but, the, but this color that is quite reflective of Egypt. And then also the orange reflects the desert and the sun. And there was a hidden level of um, meaning in there that we didn't actually originally identify. It was cleverly picked up by one of our Twitter followers, Manon Schutz, um, who noted that the letter I kind of looks like a stylized person. Um, and she said that, you know, that it kind of reflects that we're not just looking at objects, but we're also looking at the people who left the objects behind and who made those objects. Um, and this was actually quite a, a really meaningful thing that we did, we did notice because ultimately we are all telling the stories of people and the world that those people lived in. And thanks, Adam, for making the logo. And so now we want to take you behind the scenes and introduce you to our wonderful team at Integ. Uh, we're incredibly honored that so many remarkable Egyptologists were excited about this project and wanted to be part of making it a reality. Of course, we are so very lucky to have the inimitable Christiana Kohler as our other co-founder, who agreed to take on the challenge of being Integ's editor-in-chief. Uh, without her support and guidance, it would have been impossible to get Integ up and running. Um, Aaron and I will be the journal's editors, overseeing the management and the production of the journal. And I couldn't ask for a in better interdisciplinary colleague and friend to work alongside. So our four uh, brilliant inaugural board members join Christiana, Aaron and I to make up the editorial board. Yasmin El Shazli, Nadine Merler, Paul Nicholson and Ramadan Hussain will all be involved uh, with helping shape the direction and future of Integ, um, guiding the journal in its infancy to ensure that Integ remains true to its aim um, of being as it as an accessible journal um, of the highest quality. And in addition to the board, we have a team of section editors who are at the leading edge of research in their respective fields and who themselves are proponents of interdisciplinary research. And they will be responsible for overseeing sections of the journal we've identified, um, overseeing things like peer review and things like that. So that we, we are putting, we, we really trust these people and we're really glad that they are part of the initiative. Um, those people are, um, Maria Camela Gatto, who will be in charge of African interconnections, Christine Knoblauch, who is in charge of archaeological methods and theory, Amber Hood, um, who you, you are now familiar with, um, looking at archaeological science. Um, Alex Woods will be in charge of art history and architecture. Menat Ala Eldori will be in charge of bioarchaeology. I will be looking after two sections, so challenging colonialist paradigms and material culture. We also have Lere Ola Baria looking after gender theory. We have Alice Stevenson looking after historiography and museology. We have Felix Herfenmeyer looking after Mediterranean and Western Asian interconnections. We have Anna Stevens in charge of project reports, which are things like archaeological reports and things that might be coming to us. Um, we have Camilla Dibiate Dyson looking after text based approaches, and Marcello Campagno in charge of theoretical approaches. So when we were first laying out the structure of Integ, we realized that we would need to call on the help of other like-minded like scholars who also thought that Integ was a worthwhile pursuit. And these fine people make up our editorial team and our communications team. Uh, we have four editorial assistants, Hope Gillespie, Sue Kelly, John Rogers and Louisa Silva, who will assist in producing the final articles that you, our audience and our readers will, um, will sit down to read. Uh, Fatma Amin and Habiba Hussan Rogob join us as the Integ Arabic translators who will translate the abstracts of each article into um, Arabic so that Integ can be more accessible to our Egyptian audience. And we hope in the future to also extend that to include French and German. And if you're a French or German speaking colleague that would like to be involved with this, please do get in touch. Um, our communication team is responsible for engaging with you 
and um, Louisa Bryan oversees and brainstorms for our thriving social media pages as and we're now on Facebook, uh, Twitter and Instagram. Raquel Neves is responsible for making our communications beautiful and eye-catching as um, a visual communications assistant. George Aquello de Jesus is the newest member of the Integ team along with his cat Charlie and going forward he will be managing the exciting online events that we have in store for you. And as we mentioned earlier, Integ is a journal by Egyptologists for Egyptologists of all kinds. And because of that, we operate on an entirely volunteer basis. Um, no money changes hands at Integ. There's no financial benefit for anyone involved in the journal. And all necessary support is generously provided by our hosts at the University of Vienna. And this is how we can provide you, our potential authors, with full and free open access publication while still ensuring the highest standards of academic publishing. And we're so grateful to our entire editorial team of volunteers and to our hosts at the University of Vienna for generously sharing their time and expertise, and also for their dedication to the goal of seeing real and tangible change in Egyptology as a modern scientific discipline, because we literally could not do any of this without their help and support. And one of the main benefits of operating on a totally cost-free cost -free basis is that we can provide free open access publication as soon as an article is ready. That means that once your work has been accepted, once it's been copy edited and edit, edited and typeset, it will become freely available online at our website. Um, open access uh, our open access policy meets the requirements of international grant funding bodies. And because publication is on a rolling basis, it means that you don't have to wait too long for a volume to be compiled or printed. It will become available as soon as it's ready. So with a journal that's focused on interdisciplinary research, um, of course, our scope is broad. Uh, it's broad in terms of what time periods we'll be accepting articles for from prehistory to the Byzantine or Coptic periods, as well as in its geographic scope, uh, Egypt and her neighbours to the north, south, east and west. Um, beyond these bounds, we're also happy to consider articles that examine ancient Egypt's influence on the modern world and modern culture. Um, our broad scope is also reflected in the types of submissions that we'll accept. So in addition to standard research articles, we're also really keen that uh, Integ is a place for researchers to publish updates on their ongoing projects, um, allowing the Egyptology community to stay up to date with what's happening in current research. We're also very keen to facilitate dialogue and healthy, respectful debate within the Egyptological community. And as such, we'll be accepting letters to the editor, um, article critiques and responses, and uh, book reviews as well. To help promote the research of academically young scholars, we will also be publishing PhD thesis abstracts. And of course, as already mentioned, we'll be translating um, abstracts into Arabic. So with the help of our communications team, we are also focused on increasing access to Egyptology through visual and non-published media. We're aiming to present video interviews, project updates, and visual slideshows to help disseminate research and the people behind that research even further. Um, in terms of online events, we were overwhelmed with the response that our panel discussions received, and um, they will be back by popular demand. Uh, we're also starting to plan an In Conversations With series and a Building an Interdisciplinary Team series as well. I won't say more here, but do watch this space. And of course, we're active on social media platforms. We want Egyptology to be available to everyone and um, for our discussions to be truly interdisciplinary. We wanna reach out to researchers in other fields that may not have thought about how their research uh, could contribute to a breakthrough in Egyptology and vice versa. And now before wrapping up, we just wanna talk a bit about the, the public reception that we've received for the journal so far. Um, and as we mentioned a couple of times, over six weeks in March and April this year, we presented a series of themed panel discussions that critically assessed the current state of Egyptology. Um, we hosted 12 sessions, so two sessions per week. We had invited 51 invited speakers from 13 countries. And the themes of discussion ranged from archeological practice to scientific methodologies, the need for Egyptology to become post-colonial and regional interconnections and much, much more. And each panel was asked to address three specific questions. And those questions were, what has the field done well? What could the field have done better? And where does the field need to go? Summaries of each of these panels will be published soon as a special edition of the journal that will hopefully appear before the end of the year. So the people that weren't able to attend will be able to catch up on what those discussions included. Uh, the, the reach and impact of the sessions was 
quite frankly, completely overwhelming for us and, and quite a surprise. Um, we had 2,088 views. We had 739 in individual unique visitors in 48 countries around the world. The average per session was 174 viewers per panel. And we knew, like we, we were quite confident that we had a good product in, in, in Integ, but we really weren't prepared for this overwhelmingly enthusiastic response. And the overwhelming response on social media was one of general excitement. There was a consensus at the journal and its approach was something that was overdue. Um, there was huge excitement and anticipation for publications and future events that would be coming up. There was excitement about the possibility for generating more diverse discussions and debates. Um, and there was even some excited pets. So we started in a hashtag Integ Pets thing on Twitter and we had a number of people, for example, Carolyn Graves Brown's dog was watching. Um, but for us, it was, it was really, honestly, it was incredibly humbling and really encouraging for us as the journal's founders uh, to know that we've managed to make something that, that has been so warmly received by the community that we, we want to give back to. And so we want to thank all of our panelists and to every one of you who attended the panel discussions for helping to make it a success that it was. And now it's over to you, our readers, our authors, our critics and our community. We believe that there is something for everyone in INTEG and whether you're an Egyptologist or someone from another discipline whose research is applicable to Egyptology, we're interested in hearing from you. Of course, the only thing that we will not compromise on is that INTEG um, will only publish research and discussions of the highest academic quality and scientific integrity, but I think everyone is on board with that. So submissions are now open. So head on over to our website to register as, as an author and uh, to download our comprehensive author gui guidelines and templates that will actually help you to, um, to write your submission. And of course, follow us on social media to help spread the, uh, the word. Uh, you can see all our social media handles here on the screen and our contact details as well. We're really looking forward to working with you. So thank you so very much for joining us today and for listening to our thoughts on Egyptology's interdisciplinary future and Integ's part of that, the story behind Integ and how, of course, you can all be involved as well.